Good morning. Welcome to our webinar on ESG strategy and the in-house lawyer's role organized by Bird and Bird and by Servlu and Associat. The motto of our webinar is precisely the role and importance of the in-house lawyers in the implementation of companies' ESG strategy. In our perspective, the in-house lawyers can and should help to build this strategy linked, as we know, to the objectives of environmental, social and governance level sustainability. ESG practices are currently erupting in a very intense and transversal way in all areas, um, aiming to condition the choices of companies and people and lead to a change towards sustainable behaviors. Of course, the E of environment uh, has a great weight and has a great echo in the political agenda, foc focusing in the fight on the fight against climate change. And uh, of course, that we know that several uh, political instruments have been issued around it. And in the last three years, we have known a great acceleration with the European Green Deal, uh, which concentrates, uh, concentrates numerous initiatives. And these targets have been uh, stepped up uh, with a successive acceleration agenda with the fifth for 55 package and recently the Repower EU. We are then witnessing a kind of ESG boom, I think we may say uh, like this. Regulation has been evolving more and more towards requiring environmentally sustainable uh, behaviors. And together with such boom, it has also been considered essential that investors, financing institutions and economic operators use the same language and the same criteria to qualify their activities and report on them and um, as a tool in fight against, and this is very important, of course, greenwashing. There has been a common cl classification system, taxonomy uh, issued created by an European uh, regulation in 2019. Uh, and also as known, uh, the European Commission has issued a proposal of a directive in February this year to implement due diligence procedures aimed at uh, preventing human rights violations, not only in the company's own operations, but also in the uh, supply, respective supply uh, chain, and this is very important. So I think we may say that ESG is no longer indifferent to anyone, institutional investors, governments, regulators, and consumings, consumers. And uh, speaking of companies, it is a true call for action. It is the power of business as a force for good, as someone has said. And that is where we come to the role of the in-house lawyers. In fact, the rise of the ESG agenda claims for an integrated approach uh, with each company, of course, and in-house counsels are, as we know, used to dealing with risk management and compliance issues, uh, operating with the law, and therefore uh, they are often the natural leaders of such transformational initiatives within the companies. Of course, that they live in the middle of new and existing regulations, sometimes uh, with mandatory requirements, uh, best practices, either at local level or international, and all this is changing. This is a dynamic ecosystem in which uh, in-house lawyers are called to counsel for establishing the company's strategy, ESG strategy, and guiding the business procedures and processes to deal with the ESG new environment. Uh, all these topics need then an integrated approach within each company and the in-house lawyer plays here a fundamental role as said. And this is of course exactly about these challenges of the in-house lawyers in an ESG context that we want to hear from our uh, guest speakers today. I am delighted to host and introduce our three invited speakers. 
Teresa Minguez Dias, General Counsel and Compliance and Integrity Officer at Porsche Iberica. Welcome, Teresa, with a long experience as in house counsel and specifically in an ESG uh, environment. And we have also Philippe Moraes here with us today. He's a professor at Hamley Business School and is an expert in corporate governance and strategic management. And Michael Rudd, who is a partner and head of the energy and utilities uh, sector group at Burden Bird London. And Michael has a global uh, leadership role within Bird and Bird in meeting its own ESG uh, commitments and also supporting the clients in achieving theirs. Welcome, thank you for being here today. I would then immediately give the word to Philippe Moraes to present his views on ESG strategy in the perspective of the management of a company. Philippe, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, telling you a little bit about my uh, perspectives on ESG, uh, the state of affairs, uh, and what companies might, might, and boards in particular, might want to think about uh, when, uh, uh, when, when thinking about integrating ESG into their uh, strategy, and I should say, also business model, ultimately. I wanted to, um, to first uh, tell you a little bit something that I found out. Um, uh, that history gives us hope in the form of figures like Abraham Lincoln, abolition of slavery, Gandhi, freedom from colonialism, Nelson Mandela, peaceful hand to apartheid, Ruth Bader, Ginsburg, women's rights, they were all lawyers. Uh, therefore, uh, we also have uh, a lot of hope in this room and this, this virtual room. Uh, and, and hopefully that also lawyers can be, a, 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 certainly will be a, a force uh, for good and for driving the, the next big transformation uh, in society. Uh, which is the shall we uh, shall we say the green transformation, um, the digital transformation, the inclusive transformation, um, uh, quite a fundamental shift, um, and, and certainly lawyers uh, have uh, a big big uh, role to play. So how are we in terms of ESG? Well, things look. Uh, um, ESG was uh, started in two thousand and five, two thousand six with a report with the, the principles of responsible uh, investment in the UN. Uh, and uh, the study goes that uh, a few of the, um, a few of the uh, staff members responsible for the report uh, didn't, didn't know how to capture the attention of the audience. And they ca came up with, with these letters, E, S, and G, um, to try and uh, condense the meaning and try to give some, uh, some catchy uh, sort of nomenclature to to the whole approach. Uh, and ever since uh, we've seen ESG uh, becoming more and more into mainstream, uh, starting with investment, then with companies, governments, uh, and now we see uh, the ecosystem is becoming more and more uh, mature. Uh, and, and I think that over the last few weeks, we, we had some, shall we say, pains of, of growth uh pains of maturity um in, in the esg ecosystem because we we've seen how german officials raided the deutsche bank's dws uh over claims of greenwashing and we've seen how the sec uh and uh, various other um regulators have uh all of a sudden um uh, reacted and and uh threatened to crack down into misleading esg investment claims but just recently, we've also seen uh, a study, uh, which I, I actually don't recall who has done it, but that shows or uh, shows some evidence that um, companies are, are maybe uh, inflating uh, and, and manipulating their, their ESG performance to improve their scores and uh, get uh, cheaper finance and better reputation as a result. Um, there has been many challenges to, to ESG, and, and here certainly are a number of uh, areas uh, that uh, in the in-house lawyer will have to uh, pay close attention, not least uh, making sure 
that the company uh, is credible and transparent and does what it says. I'm, I'm not going to be the one who's going to be telling you about legal frameworks and re regulatory frameworks. I've got much better placed people uh, in this room to do so. Uh, I want to talk to talk to you about what uh, uh, a colleague from INSEAD has put as uh, three big expansions or three uh, three large expansions we're seeing from the 20th century to the 21st century. And the first one is from outputs to outcomes. So no longer we want uh, more cars, we want mobility solutions, no longer we want uh, healthcare, institutionalized uh, disease treatment, healthcare, we want uh, health, uh, health promotion um, um, and health improvement. Um, we also don't want cash. Cash is no longer enough. Companies need to provide, in addition to cash, contribution. And competence, doing things well, efficiently, is no longer enough as well. We are now demanding companies to show character not only to do things well, but to do the right things. And these are three fundamental expansions. And what uh, uh, Shubhi Rangan uh, uh, says is uh, what we need is reg regenerative governance. So we need relevance, and this speaks to your purpose. We need rigor in the execution, in the evidence. We need, of course, resources, and we need reputation. And I use this, um, this, for, um, this model to layer a few of my own ideas. So what are boards to do? So boards need to craft the purpose, yeah? Uh, ESG is a board matter because it's about, if you're really uh, serious about it, it's about transforming, it's about changing the constitution of the company, okay? It's about searching for relevance. Uh, and the companies that will last uh, into the future will uh, show a high degree of relevance to society. Then second, it's about identifying the underlying assets that need to be disposed, substituted, or transformed. So it's about the resources. The third one is about determining the pace and scale of change. It's about rigor in that space and in that scale. And much of that space and change uh, comes from the, the regulator and companies should determine their own pace and their own scale of change. And finally, it's important that there is a, 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 a rethink and a development of stakeholder engagement approach plan. And this is about your reputation. Crafting the purpose. It's more than just nice words. We all know this. It's not. Uh, it's no longer uh, just uh, you know boilerplate sort of uh, uh, headlines in the, the website. Uh, it's something that has to hold meaning. And what I hear from chairmen and CEOs that do it well is that if you do this well, it really helps you to determine. Uh, to determine what assets you need and what assets you don't need, what assets you need to transform and what assets you need to dispose um, and so on. So this is not also done in, uh, in the boardroom. Uh, it requires deep dialogue and reflection between the board and various stakeholders. And it's about meaning and relevance to society as a whole not just to shareholders, not just to the company, of course, that's important, but it requires a, a, a soul searching. It requires to understand the company's identity and projecting that identity into the world in a way that is relevant and purposeful. Uh, it's enduring and it justifies the business existence beyond profit, beyond cash. It's about uh, contribution. I think the, the second thing, uh, that, that boards, and this may be short, medium, and long term, of course, is to really determine uh, which underlying assets, business assets, uh, uh, exist and um, what to do with them in the transformation. The first thing they need to, 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 to of course, uh, look into is those assets that uh, need to be disposed. Have nothing to the purpose, are a destruction, don't meet the criteria. Some assets are 
are required, uh, but there are, and there are some substitutes in the market, readily available technology, tried and tested. And so they need to be substituted or improved. Um, and uh, finally, uh, a third aspect are those assets that need transforming. And they are unique to the business. There is no alternative. They need transforming and solutions must be found from within the business. Um, so this is something where uh, often people don't link enough uh, the ESG effort, the transformation effort with R&D and innovation. Uh, to, uh, I often uh, ask, uh, you know, what's your innovation policy strategy? What's your R&D investments? Are they aligned to the transition? Are they aligned to trying to transform your business into the, into the future? Uh, are they ESG uh, 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 compliant or, or, or at least uh, they, they, do they meet the criteria? And if they don't, or, or if that, uh, that uh, investment in innovation and R&D is, is not aligned, uh, then um, I find it very, very hard to understand how the company is trying to do that transition. A few other ideas about determining the pace and the scale of change. It's about also promising, yeah? It's about promising uh, how fast, uh, how, how quick uh, you're going to be able to deliver on your transition. Uh, I think the first thing that is always wise is to say, don't let the market or the regulator define the pace, 2030, 2050. It's about your own story as a company. It's about what you can do uh, with your teams, with your existing resources, with your position, with your history. Uh, and it's about um, being true to yourself. It doesn't, uh, you, you don't have to, uh, to follow uh, uh, what is imposed from the outside if that's not, uh, if that's not right for, for, for the company. It's a marathon, it's not 100 meters. And for some companies, it will be a kind of a Iron Man type of marathon, okay? Uh, it's going to be hard to transform, uh, and I think being realistic um, is uh, it's very important. Um, because if you go too fast, you may also crash and burn. So resources that need transforming and innovation, they take time. Uh, and we cannot um, predict uh, how the necessary technological innovation and solutions will come uh, um, and how fast they will come. And finally, the other idea I wanted to, to bring today uh, was to the importance of stakeholder engagement. And stake, when I say stakeholder, uh, you know, it's not just the board and the investors. Of course, they're very important. Uh, and the management and so on. It's, it's the wider uh, stakeholder base, um, trying to understand uh, your stakeholders in terms of their, their power to influence your agenda and to impose uh, uh, restrictions on you, their legitimacy to do so, and the urgency of their claims. Also determining which claims are contractual or moral. Um, it's important to keep your promises. Reputation is about keeping promises. Uh, so don't promise uh, too much. Uh, promise uh, what you genuinely think you can achieve. Uh, and continuously engage with your stakeholders to tell them where you are on the journey. And I think in terms of reporting, uh, I mean, there will be, there, there, there's, there's a number of frameworks. Uh, there's a number of, um, of frameworks in, for, for reporting. Uh, they are consolidating as well. Uh, I think the important thing with the reporting is telling your story, okay? And as, as much as measurement of KPIs as it is to telling a compelling story that it doesn't need to be perfect, it doesn't need to be, uh, it needs to be genuine and authentic. Uh, and if it is genuine and authentic, the market will understand and will support. And that, that's my, my genuine belief. So I'd uh, stop here. Uh, these are my, uh, my remarks. I hope they, they were helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, for your uh, brilliant presentation and for all the ideas on how companies should do and organize themselves with this ESG objectives. I would then invite Teresa to share uh, her vision with us, her own experience as a general counsel of a big company 
facing specifically the challenge of uh, decarbonization and being simultaneously the compliance and integrity officer of Porsche Iberica. Please, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Luisa, Cervulo, and, and Berkenberg for inviting me to participate in this seminar, uh, webinar, um, which I think is the utmost interest. Um, I, I'm going to, to give my personal uh, view about ESG and within the um, position of in-house lawyer and talking about the, the existence of a business case for the ESG uh, for the companies and also for the in-house lawyer as a primary responsible of, for the function. Um, we've seen since the 70s that the development of the corporate social responsibility um, with a, a slow pace, but it has been, in my opinion, it has been since um, August uh, 2019 with the Business Roundtable Manifesto, um, where there was formulating or a big statement from the most important CEOs of the US companies, um, talking about their commitment to reformulate the traditional corporate purpose theory, moving away from the maximization of profits to deliver um, a sustainable value to the society as a whole. So for me, this has been uh, the start of the, of the race uh, with a lot of drivers of change. For example, um, BlackRock and Fidelity, who, is, who keeps moving and pressing for companies to adopt ESG policies uh, under the basis that they have higher yields. And it's true, the investment funds pay more to the companies which adopt ESG policies. We have also seen a social trend um, from the whole society who wants that the companies do better and deliver part of the profits that they take from the society while, while sell, selling their products um, to deliver some value to the society as a whole. And we have as well regulatory requirements. We are in the phase, in my opinion, of a standardization of the ESG with all the EU regulations, but also by the um, SEC regulations and, and Department of Justice um, reviews. And we uh, also assist to uh, employees activism, which support the company's actions and also shareholders activism. Of course, when the um, proxy holders um, deliver a clear message to the board, um, as regards the implementation of ESG. Traditionally, the, 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 the corporate, society, corporate, corporate social responsibility has been allocated to uh, communication departments or maybe marketing departments or quality control departments in the companies. But because of this um, tremendous boost that is keeping, um, and because all the conditions that I will talk about um, a bit later, um, I think there is a natural move to the legal function or compliance function. Probably much more, um, there are more reasons to, to be allocated to legal when it, the function is shared with compliance and also, um, intervene in ethics or in the culture of the company. Um, and because that is what is, when we talk about ESG, we talk mainly or in a broad sense about environment, social and governance matters. But, but what we are talking about actually, well, we are talking about uh, non-accounting information, which gives a proposition of value of the company, which is now perceived 
by the investors. And they are able to measure this and give certain value to the company because the company has adopted ESG policies. That means that ESG equals to brand value and reputation. Then it uh, should be operationalized and included in the acti business activities of the company. And of course, the point of the first point is to embed the strategy of the company with the ESG policies. For example, um, um, you, you should, as Philip said before, you should take into consideration <clears throat> your business activity and how you can do better in terms of protection to the environment or protection to the human rights by increasing controls in the supply chain, for example. But we should Keep in mind that we are talking at the end of the day of value, delivering value for the company when the company is delivering value to the society. So I do not think a better guardian of the corp enterprise value as a lawyer. So we are always, because um, our function, always um, taking care of the risk of the company, managing the situation, they probably the reputational crisis and protecting what well, the end of the day is our first function, which is, I always said, my first client is my company, my second is my CEO. So we are here for protecting the value of the company. And from this position, it's natural the movement to assume this um, monitoring or this governance of the ESG system. Because there is a lot of consequences if we do not well, which are, we have talked about greenwashing, but in the, in the new directive from um, the new sustainability uh, directive, it um, recognizes or it grants uh, damage actions for misstatement in the ESG reporting, or even if we, in the public position of the companies, not only, we are not talking about only uh, financial reporting. We are talking about what your directors do, what they talk about in the social networks, and what are the positions set out by the directors and the management. So we will have consumer actions, damage actions, in para, very similar to those um, granted to the consumers affected by cartels, which is um, a high, high risk to monitor. We will have the problems of misstatement in financial reporting as well, um, even though we can have a shortfall of directors duty of care if they do not take proper measures to manage the ESG information. So from the, our department, from our function, what should we do? We should operationalize the function, take care of this, helping to set up the ESG strategy, um, adopt the corresponding metrics, taking into consideration the homogeneous standards, adopt policies and adopt our processes to what we are saying or what, what we are committing from the ESG perspective. And of course, as all risk governance systems, we should have reportings, audit, system, audit procedures, and being able to forecast new developments to quickly adopt them or to put our, our company in the position to adopted. We've seen that the um, in, importance of um, um, ESG is day by day, uh, more and more. We've seen, for example, in um, 25 May this year, the Department of Justice 
has adopted was considering a proposal for ESG disclosures, extending also the um, the information, the, the set of disclosures to as well not only registered investment companies but also to to investment advisors because we see that we see in the market a lot of funds, investment funds, or a lot of advisors um, urging consumers to invest in ESG or green bonds when we do not know clearly what they mean or what we are talking about. So I think that we are now in the phase of setting clear standards, then we will have to include those standards in our policies and setting KPIs, of course, and reporting systems. And I do not think a better function for doing this that uh, the in-house uh, lawyer function. So thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa, very much for sharing with us your experience and these views. Uh, which I'm sure will be inspirational and very important for other legal counsels in our audience today. Uh, we'll move then to Michael. It's then your turn to tell us uh, about how you see the ESG issues from a legal perspective and also your opinion on the relevance of in-house uh, lawyers within this context. Please, Michael, go ahead. Thank you so much, Anna Louisa. Uh, absolutely delighted to be here and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to compliment uh, Theresa and Philippe's insights um, by offering a broader kind of macro perspective. Um, as Anna Louisa mentioned, uh, my day job does have an energy leaning and given that energy production and consumption accounts for circa 80% of global emissions. Um, my, uh, I, I wanted to kind of give you comfort that my observations today aren't with an energy bias, they are intended to be sector agnostic. So I guess the ESG journey for each of you to date and going forward is obviously going to be different, including where your organization is currently on the journey and uh, the legal team's role. Um, John, Kerry, the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, was asked to give the keynote address at the ABA General Assembly uh, last year and made some pertinent observations. The leading one, which the ABA reported on after the event, was You are all climate lawyers now, whether you want to be or not, which I endorse. Um, it was also interesting, as a side note, that um, the ABA announced several additional resolutions relating to su sustainability in ESG and the role of the legal community, which is obviously broader than just in-house lawyers and private practice lawyers, but it includes academics and uh, legal institutions and so on. Um, so in their latest resolution, you know, they emphasize the right of every human being to dignity and a clean and healthy environment and the responsibility of the legal community to include and consider the perspectives of marginalized and vulnerable communities when determining environmental just, um, justice decision-making and, and implementation. And for me, this is just one of many examples that emphasizes the role of lawyers and that social sustainability, or more simply people, is just as important as environmental sustainability. So let's, let's look at the role of in-house legal teams from an internal perspective. And, and I'm sure um, uh, Theresa uh, Philippe and I uh, can, can offer some, some thoughts on external advisors when we come to the Q&A. As John Kerry said, we're all climate lawyers now. It doesn't mean you have to be an ESG subject matter expert to play a role. Um, you know, the chair and founder of the Chancery Lane project mentioned in the quote here. Um, and for those not familiar with it, uh, the Chancery Lane project is a practical and freely accessible climate change lawyers tool. Well, the founder said in, in a recent article, you know, I'm not an environmental or climate change lawyer. Uh, I'm not a net zero expert. 
Uh, he said, like you, I'm also working for a profit-making company and I'm simply a commercial in-house lawyer taking a leadership position on climate change. I think there are numerous tools available to all of us to help guide on what the role is for in, in, in internal and external ESG initiatives for in-house legal teams. But one of the challenges is the volume of information that's out there. Um, I've put a few, uh, which I think are good examples on this slide. I particularly wanted to mention some interesting stats that came out of the Association of Corporate Council's latest Chief uh, Legal Officer survey. Um, and it was a and it touched on various trends and, and obviously relevantly for this morning, ESG trends. So on average, 24% of respondents are now responsible for ESG, up 9% from two years ago. Um, that percentage was higher where the legal team's function included overseeing risk, uh, where 35% said they were also responsible for ESG, or ethics, where they said 37% were also responsible for ESG. Um, of the 76% of respondents who said ESG is not currently part of their responsibility, 16% of them said it should be. Now that doesn't sound like a particularly large number, but it did place it third in the list of functions that do not currently form part of uh, in-house legal teams, but, but uh, respondents said they should. So it placed behind compliance uh, and risk. And it was up five places from last year's survey, where only 8% of respondents said uh, ESG should be part of the legal function. Um, in the same survey, 40% of the CLO, CLOs said that ESG issues are forcing companies to improve their compliance efforts, both to comply with the law and, and respond to stakeholder expectations. And in the, in the public sector, 16% of CS, uh, CLOs said they were receiving pressure from investors, interestingly, either for taking a stand on ESG matters or refraining from taking a stand. So um, recognizing that this remains a, in some areas, particularly for public bodies, um, a, 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 a divisive issue. So what that survey, along with other reports, emphasizes, it's the fact that ESG is not fully embedded within organisations, not fully embedded within legal teams. Um, and in my mind, I think there's various motivations beyond simply risk and compliance and objective reasons why I think that legal teams want to be involved and, and should have a role, as already emphasised in practice by what Theresa said earlier. Um, once again, looking at a macro perspective, um, uh, Stanford University's Rock Center for Corporate Governance did a, did a research of about 70 GCs at the end of last year um, from a diverse range of industries, some, uh, the majority of which um, had values over a billion US dollars. Um, some of the key outputs of, of that was that over 75% said they faced pressure to grow ESG efforts uh, in the past three years which raises, raises the follow-on question, where is that pressure coming from? Um, the majority of it is coming from employees. 48% uh, of respondents said employees. Uh, next was investors, 44%. Uh, uh, customers, 41 Advocacy groups, 33 And ESG rating agencies, 24 um, That emphasizes that it's not only external pressure, but it's, in, it's primarily internal. Um, but it also emphasizes the breadth of stakeholders who have an interest um, in this issue um, and have an expectation that those in their value chain uh, should have uh, should have a role. Um, in terms of how that pressure is manifesting into action, most of the respondents to the Stanford survey said they're investing more money in the diversity, equity, and inclusion part of ESG more than anything else. Um, uh, on a positive note, 72% uh, uh, said that uh, that said somewhat or strongly uh, believe that ESG investment will improve their company's long-term financial performance. And then I, I imagine we'll touch on this during Q&A, but on the reporting side, some, ex, ex, um, whilst recognising 
uh, both the need for and in, in many instances the legal requirement for reporting, they were worried that disclosing ESG data may actually increase legal and regulatory risk. Um, which in my mind emphasises the importance of the in-house legal team being involved in all facets of ESG, in this instance, reporting. So what does being engaged look like for the in-house uh, legal team? Um, and of course, this covers the full spectrum of, of um, ESG activities, whether that's compliance, risk, governance, oversight, or many other things such as embedding sustainability into contractual relationships, whether to run the business, uh, funders, insurers, and supply chains, with funders and insurers increasingly embedding sustainability principles, or at a more basic level, um, divesting from businesses they don't perceive sustainable, or not insuring if they see uh, your business is not sustainable, or that there's a, a greater risk, or obviously the cost of funding or insurance becoming more expensive. Uh, and then on the supply chain, um, embedding supply chain uh, ESG principles into your supply chain and, and how you do that in a um, streamlined and efficient and collaborative way, particularly um, where businesses will often have a diverse range of supply chains um, where the level of control to influence the ESG in that supply chain might be greater or lesser depending on the relationship. I and mean, then obviously embedding sustainability in the contractual relationships that create value, whether that is your revenue stream contracts or through um, acquiring new businesses that help achieve your ESG initiatives or disposing of businesses that are either a ESG value creation proposition for your business, so you're realizing value, or it's because as Philippe said earlier, it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset or a business that does not reflect or um, the, 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 does not enable you to achieve uh, sustainable growth going forward. So I'm going to look at this slide now from the perspective of com com compliance, given that is one often the top of the list of issues when one first engaged in a conversation with ESG, um, and two because the CL CLO um, uh, HLC survey that said um, for legal teams that don't currently have compliance as part of their function, 43% said it ought to be. So let's look at compliance and ESG first from a broader kind of organizational level before we look at uh, the in-house uh, legal team's role. So from an organizational level, we are seeing organizations invest in protocols and systems, uh, primarily people and technology to kind of monitor, manage and document ESG compliance. Um, recognizing it's an ever-evolving landscape of regulation, policy, standards, guidelines, in some instances mandatory, in some instances uh, voluntary. And when they're investing in ESG tools, they're, they often look at what they did and um, what they're currently doing in uh, ABC compliance more generally, and can they utilize and adapt existing compliance tools for ESG. Um, the organization's looking at how they can influence and structure um, uh, the ever-evolving ESG landscape, including kind of stakeholder in engagement and making sure they've got protocols and systems around that, as well as protocols and systems to deal with greater and more intrusive ESG oversight. Um, they're also looking at ESG change management and continual improvement programs to ensure both compliance and achieving goals beyond ESG compliance, such as being a good global citizen, buying green energy, reducing carbon footprints, um, supply chain that I mentioned earlier, as well as an opportunity to create innovative sources of business value. Um, um, new regulation, yes, my mean compliance, but it also can create opportunities. So looking at this now, compliance through the lens of the in-house legal team. There are, you know, multiple areas. I'm just going to touch on six. Um, embedding the relevant ESG skills within the legal team, including through capacity building and the other things I mentioned on the slide. I also mentioned, you know, creating cross-functional ESG teams with the objective of encouraging early and regular ESG engagement by the business within the, within the legal team. 
The legal team also wants to support the business to integrate ESG compliance within the business objectives, internal policy and external published policies. It ought to undertake due diligence of existing contracts um, and update template contracts to identify potential ESG um, kind of compliance requirements. Um, when creating templates um, with ESG specific provisions, it's then also about how do you standardize and replicate, recognizing that for many organizations, um, uh, transacting is not necessarily limited to the legal team. You might have a procurement function or other departments who also have internal authority to transact using standardized contracts. And I guess my, my final point on that in terms of legal teams and their role with compliance is, is of course allocating appropriate resource and systems to identify and respond to potential and, and actual ESG compliance failures as early as possible with um, you know, being be mindful of Philippe's example earlier of, um, of the greenwashing dawn raid um, of, of Deutsche Bank uh, uh, earlier this month. So if I was going to leave you with kind of two, two final messages, I think my first would be don't wait. For all the reasons that Philippe and Teresa have, have, have already covered, my other message is you're not alone. You know, today is just one of numerous um, thought leadership examples out there of bringing a community together to help embed ESG within the legal team within a meet in, in, in a meaningful way, knowing that there are other peers in other in-house legal teams, in external advisors, in industry bodies who were there to offer support and guidance knowing that each of us is at a slightly different pace in the journey. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for having shared uh, with us your views on this and your excellent contributions. I think we will move straight to the Q&A part. I'm sure that your presentations have raised a lot of interest in our audience and uh, some questions are already written in our Q&A chat. Uh, the first, I believe, is addressed to Teresa, because we have here one of our attendees would like to know how uh, important you think uh, it is the true engagement of your legal team for this ESG commitment. I think that um, Michael has already addressed this point. Uh, just now, then you, you can have also some, some contributions. And the question also is uh, on how sensitive you feel young, uh, younger lawyers are to this uh, new agenda. So we thank have you. the first. Yeah, thank you, Ana Luisa. I, I think, as you said, that Michael has covered this when talking about uh, the the engagement of the, the in-house uh, team and also the retention policies. When we are talking about ESG, we are talking about uh, meaning, purpose. So as I said, it's not ESG policies, it's not only uh, a question, an economic question, but it, it's a, a social demand for the companies and multinationals to deliver value. So it means to, to be able to do something good at the same time that you are doing your work or doing your work with good purpose, helping the society, help taking care of the employees, taking care of your supply chain. So I think that uh, younger lawyers especially which are more, I would say, we talk about my millennials in Spain. I don't know if it is the same word in, in, in Portugal. There is a shift in, a change in the mentality. So I brought, um, I've been, I grew up with the, uh, I say, the hard capitalism. Uh, but our millennials are much more in the social one. So I think being able to collaborate um, 
in, in, in with the society and deliver good um, is always a good policy of retention. Michael, do you want to add some contribution on this? Well, I'll, t I'll touch on the um, the talent point. Um, certainly, uh, there are very uh, various uh, what I would call ethical questions that um, the future leaders in our profession are asking, um, and DNI and ESG are two very common points. Um, it's also important for those already within the business um, who are asking questions and driving the organization to, to for change. You know, what, why aren't we doing this? Or when, uh, when are we doing this? Um, I think that's a really positive development. Um, I also think it's positive that um, future leaders um, are willing to challenge um, both potential recruiters, oh, sorry, potential employers and existing employers on this topic. Um, but in challenging, my experience has been that they'll say, but I also want to play a role in helping my organization um, make the change. And I, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I think it's a wonderful development. Um, and I think uh, organizations need to recognize that, but also challenge that drive and enthusiasm um, uh, that is um, very much there. And I think that the second one goes to Philippe Moraes. Um, you said that um, ESG strategy is about uh, changing the constitution of the company and uh, telling your story as it does not need to be uh, perfect. Do you really think that boards are really um, engaged and really care about ESG strategy? Um, there are some studies that say that most companies do not really prioritize the, the ESG strategy. If you have here a, a comment to Thank you. on this topic. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, I, I, I do agree that uh, boards, uh, most boards, I should say, are, are still very early in the journey. Uh, and the transition is not just in the business. Boards need to transition their own uh, uh, mentality. Um, and uh, very much so, uh, maximizing shareholder value, as uh, Teresa uh, has alluded to, is still, uh, by and large, uh, the dominant logic in most boardrooms. Uh, and that's the reality. Uh, um, uh, some boardrooms have moved to, to what is known in the literature, which is called enlightened shareholder value, which is uh, still pursuing shareholder value, um, as in uh, financial value, but uh, also uh, attempting to, um, to, do, um, to introduce some um, uh, mitigation uh, and, and, uh, and trying to do some good in the, on, on the, along the way. Um, uh, the third type of boards that uh, um, that uh, are out there are, are, are trying to, and they are the minority, uh, are really trying to to create sustainable value uh, in the longer term, um, and um, and really looking, uh, having a hard look into uh, how how each stakeholder uh, gets affected. Uh, uh, on every single decision the, uh, the, that the business uh, takes, um, so uh, so I say I should say that the companies that are in the, in the last category uh, boards, they uh, they uh, they have to have also a, a special set of circumstances, okay? Because in the uh, if you have a, a shareholder register uh, that is very vast with very different appetites for, for risk and value, um, it's going to be very diff difficult to uh, design a strategy that will uh, appeal to all when it comes to ESG. Um, I, I think family firms in this regard, they do have uh, quite an interesting uh, special set of conditions to uphold the long-term view, which is required 
uh, I think, um, and to to have the the patience to do the transformation in a way that uh, that is more fundamental. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but the, the boards to 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 for, from all that I've been hearing and, and also uh, researching uh, are very much still stuck uh, in. in in, in the past, I said there's a minority. I should say top twenty percent that are um, that are doing uh, that are ahead in the journey. The other ones are are just being following the trends and being uh, I shouldn't even say fast followers, but just in many cases observers. Um, yes, uh, Flip, I, 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 I also found it very interesting that you, when you said that it's about telling your own story, this is my, my personal comment, because in fact, being realistic uh, uh, when facing DSG challenges is something I, I think very important, otherwise you will lose your way and not meet the objectives. You, tell, you told us about being uh, genuine, authentic and do not hide your 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 your, your story and uh, begin with your own story i think this is quite a big challenge for small and medium enterprises i'm thinking about portugal uh, and the way uh, i i think they can manage this is being honest the company shall be honest with themselves uh, because of course that one size does not does not fit all and you can't go for the most ambitious uh, goals and forget your reality i think it's this a, is really a very realistic approach <laughs> and very important uh, one yeah i just yeah sorry i, I know you, you're going to say something but I just no no please to, go ahead uh, i just wanted to say with regards to small and medium-sized companies uh that, mm -hmm. that in fact i i found that they they look many of them look at sustainability ESG as, as a business opportunity much more than just a risk uh, and i think larger companies see it more as a risk so um so for those companies that are small and agile enough uh um, and enlightened enough they they see this as an opportunity to to be very distinct in the marketplace and and to actually you know do both do something that makes business sense and also do good by by being very uh you know uh very green in how they they because that their business model is changeable and and uh, faster than a big business model well established so in fact they, they see it as, as more of an opportunity so i i actually have big hope for the very entrepreneurial, you know, innovative uh, SMEs uh, that uh, that I think they can they can actually be the drivers of the transformation as much as the big companies. Thank you, Flip. That's it. We have now a question to Michael. I think we have also here in our audience some external legal counsels, and they want to know what about the role of external legal consultants. Um, since you have uh, the experience, you can share with us how uh, you think that legal uh, cons consultants can help the in-house lawyers building the ESG strategy and managing the respective risk. Absolutely. Um, I think my starting simple message is to practice what you preach. So if um, you're an external advisor, whether it's a law firm or other professional advisor, and you are looking to support your clients um, and in doing so make money out of um, supporting your clients in their ESG journey, then you yourself should be um, undertaking your own journey. Um, I think we are seeing um, predominantly from the US, but it is growing elsewhere, uh, increasing uh, requirements when um, clients are looking to engage law firms as to the law firm's sustainability um, credentials and that it being given greater weight when evaluating the appointment of lawyers whether on a panel or for specific appointments uh, particularly for panels um, uh, we are seeing and I anticipate we'll see more targets being set um, like we have seen in DNI such that if you're appointed this year on a three or five year panel appointment, 
um, by the end of the third or the fifth year, you would be required to have achieved more in your ES3 strategy, just as you would in your DNI strategy, with the possibility if you don't hit those targets, you may not be asked to um, uh, uh, bid to get on the panel again, or knowing that um, you um, you're when being evaluated, um, that could have a more material impact, negative impact uh, or positive, depending on uh, how you're achieving that, your ESG goals. Um, uh, I also think that there's some great examples out there, some, some publicly available, some private reports on what internal um, or in-house legal teams are saying about the role of external lawyers um, in supporting them. And there was one that stood out for me. I, I, I can't name who it was from, but there was three points that uh, this senior in-house lawyer made. Um, the first was to agree that any law firm advisors uh, uh, have a right to disconnect, which for them involves specifying acceptable working hours and no sending of emails during certain hours. So this is about people, which is one of the points I made earlier. This is not just about the environment. Um, their second point was to focus on on avoiding litigation and approach disputes with the goal of finding settlement agreements with the company's goal to sustain long-term positive relationships, um, particularly relationships that help them achieve their ESG goals, but not necessarily uh, just that. And to help ensure that the, the, the client's contracts are balanced, uh, which the in-house team defines as fair, transparent, and clear to, to their customer, their own customer base. And so when we think about ESG and we think about it as a, as a subset of, of ethical behaviours, I think it's also important to, for external lawyers to engage with their clients beyond just a very narrow thinking of what ESG means to support a, a, a client and look at it um, you know, more broadly. And I think some of those examples, as well as others that I've seen around individual wellbeing, um, long-term sustainable business growth um, seem to be fair are all broader points that um, kind of resonate within the ESG agenda. Totally agree and I think we have one last question here uh, and it goes I think mainly to Teresa and it is about the bridge that uh, in-house lawyer has to establish also with the business units. Um, the in-house lawyer plays a very important role, but he needs the permanent collaboration from the business side, as said today. Uh, the topics are most uh, times technical and demand technical input. And the function of the in-house counsel is much conditioned by the inputs he receives from the business units. How important do you think that this collaborative approach is? And um, can, uh, in case there is some resistance from the business units, what strategies uh, do you think that are important to surpass it? I think, Teresa, that you, you also mentioned, and this goes connected with this, that um, the, the previously the ESG strategy or the, the themes that are involved were held by different sectors of the company. And with this ESG agenda, they were um, directed to the legal uh, counsel. Uh, but in fact, as the question mentions, um, the in-house lawyers still needs the uh, contributions and the inputs from the business. How do you uh, think it is important to manage this dual uh, um, importance roles? Well, uh, well, we are talking we are talking about ESG, but uh, in the sense that it should be meaningful business. So. It's not a question of legal, it's not a question of compliance, it's a question of business, doing the business in the, so, in the right sort of way. So um, the main responsible for this are the business. So the strategy is the point of, the, the first point, strategy of the company. 
and then the operations implementing the strategy of the company. The role of the in-house is as in compliance or in integrity. First, setting up the right culture. Second, um, as we do very well, being like a rangers, organizing the system and the processes and, and look for the risks, of course, litigation risk, um, market risk, um, and adopt the proper measures. So it's like um, when we talk about compliance, we talk about the third lines of defense. The first one is the operations where they are owning the risks. I would say this, I think the same applies to ESG. So it should be main responsibility for the board when adopting the strategy of the company, but then it should be main responsibility of operations when doing the business. And we as in-house lawyers should be here to monitor, to help, to structure the system, to review the information regarding ESG and the reportings, but it shouldn't be um, much more different that in when we talk or we work with compliance. The teams, of course, need to be transversal with participants from all departments. As we said, for example, procurement, it takes a very important uh, role in implementing ESG policies when selecting the suppliers, when checking out the, 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 well, the controls and reviewing the, well, the integrity of our suppliers, or we as legal, strictly legal department when drafting the contracts, when doing business due diligence. And I would say that in just very, very quick, we will see ESG due diligence of companies when acquiring the companies as well because of the liabilities that can be attached to, to a bad implementation of the ESG policies. But it's a question of, uh, ESG is a question of all the company. Um, environmental protection as well should be, well, in my case, I also have the role of environmental officer, but um, in other organization, maybe the facilities officer or manager has this role. So, it's, it's a question of all the company and the interaction of the legal department shouldn't be, uh, we, we are, well, I would say we should not be the rising star. The rising star should be the operations when implementing the, the, the corresponding policies. We should be there to help and serve as always. Thank you, Teresa, for this. Uh, last sentence, we should not be the rising star. I think it's uh, 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 an important message you left us. Uh, we're reaching almost uh, the end of our time. From my side, it was very interesting and enriching to hear your contributions. And I think it's time to pass the word to Paulo Camara, which, who is our managing partner of Cervo and also the head of our ESG group to close this webinar. Paulo. Thank you, and Lisa, and, and thank you all. This has been a, a remarkable webinar with complementary, very insightful perspectives from all sides. It, it is clear that ESG is not a, a lonely uh, project. It, it's a project that involves all the company, all the, the elements in the company. And, and clearly, uh, uh, the debate that we had and the, the interventions that we uh, listened to uh, confirm the importance of discussing the expansion of the uh, role of legal counsel under these ESG developments. And I, I think this, this expansion is, is still at, uh, uh, at, at a uh, development curve, and that includes on the one side risk prevention and risk management, so, namely in terms of greenwashing and litigation risk. And I think both Michael and Teresa and, and have stressed the, the fact that more pressure in terms of uh, disclosures and more risk and of course 
that that means that uh, that the, the role of, of, of the, the internal council is, is is paramount in that respect. Secondly, monitoring the ESG disclosures because they do represent uh, statements that have to be accurate. They will be audited under the, the forthcoming directive uh, under the EU regime. But but for now on, it it, it relies very much on, on internal monitoring, and so the, the, this role of monitoring disclosure is very important. Uh, thirdly, as Teresa mentioned, the, 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 the role of culture in terms of ESG, and of course, uh, the, the chief legal officer has to uh, adapt the organization, help the adaptation of the organization to new regulatory interventions. That, that is also very important. Uh, fourthly, the articulation of policy and procedures, uh, because the whole corporate government system has to be in place, uh, uh, matching all the, the, the commitments and the outputs and the outcomes, as, as Philippe said as well. Uh, and finally, the interactions with other internal bodies, this transversal exercise, uh, connecting the dots between compliance, uh, audit, internal auditing and, and risk management, and also to the supply chain companies, which really is, is a big challenge that the new proposed directive will imply. Uh, uh, so the, the, the stakes are very high and the expectations are high in terms of the rule of, of the legal counsel. And above all, I would say that the legal counsel ends up playing not only a role regarding the compliance with the law, the, the, the legal application of the law, but also an advisory role, uh, uh, a role that goes beyond uh, uh, the mere compliance with the law, of course, uh, as Teresa said, even not being a, the rising star, even, even a very humbling and serving uh, uh, function, but, but, but that advisory role, I think it's very important to be taken into into account as well. And so I think to all our excellent speakers, Philippe Murais, Teresa Minguez, and Mike Lebrard, I think they provide an excellent basis for, for, for reflection. And also to my partner, uh, and Elisa Guimarães, for, for the moderation of this webinar. Uh, and I thank you also to the attendees in this event. Uh, as Elisa said, uh, uh, this debate is very much about meaning, about, about business and the legal goal being a force for good. And so we hope this session was both informative and inspirational. And thank you all. And once we talk about a force for good, may the force be with you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.